Welcome back. I'm here again with uh, Dr. Gary Statz, and we are continuing with our walk through the Old Testament. And um, we're beginning with chapter 12 of Genesis, and uh, with the story of Abram. So, Gary, could you begin by just showing the transition between Genesis 11 and Genesis 12? Yes, thank you, Rob. I think when we come to Genesis 12, we, also, we have a new beginning. We're moving to one man and his family through whom the Lord is now going to carry out salvation history, that being Abraham. In the first 11 chapters, we look primarily at uh, nations as a whole, goyim, at the universal humankind. Now, the Lord is working through one man, Abraham, uh, to establish, can I say, salvation history. So it really is a, a turning point, a new beginning, as we come to chapter 12 and following. And as we see God speaking into Abram's life, he, he calls him to, to make a change himself. Could you recount the story of the call of Abraham? Yes. Abraham was from Ur of the Chaldees, and uh, we're told in Acts chapter 7, the God of glory appeared to him. And after appearing to him, he goes to Haran from Ur. Haran was north of Palestine. And basically, it was still the center of moon god worship, the worship of the god Sin, the moon god. And so God calls Abraham to go, and Terah, his father, goes, the text tells us, and probably, perhaps, I'm thinking, under the uh, encouragement of, of, Ram, of Abraham. So from there, after Terah dies, Abraham then moves back, or moves into Canaan, the land of Canaan. And the Lord actually begins by telling him, you go, lech lecha, go from your family from your kindred, from the house of your father, unto a land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation. And I will, and, and literally he says, Eye beracha, which in Hebrew is be a blessing, and I will bless those who bless you. The one who curses you, I will curse. And in you, nivrachu kol mishpachot ha'adama, in you all families of the earth shall be blessed. So I believe it's, it's, there's so much in that promise, but the step of faith that Abraham has to take would be to go from the familiar into a land whereby he had never been. And the Lord then tells him he's going to multiply him, he's going to make him a great nation, he's going to bless him, and he's going to bless those that bless his descendants in him and curse the one that curses uh, Abraham. But there's that beautiful reference, in you all nations will be blessed. And I think, Rob, that's, for a Christian, that's a great Christological moment as well, especially as we look at the New Testament. But you may want to address that as we're talking about this, I'm thinking. <clears throat> yeah, that, that covenant that the Lord makes with Abraham at the very beginning is something that the, the scriptures go back to time and time and time again. Exactly. And that last phrase in verse 3, Nivracha kol mishpachot ha'adama, in you uh, all nations will be blessed. Nivrachu. Uh, it is interesting that in the Jewish world, they understand that as a reflexive idea. In other words, all nations will bless themselves in you. Sort of like, may you be like Abraham. <laughs> uh, the Hebrew is in what we call the nifal stem. Uh, and it can have a reflexive meaning. It also can have a passive meaning. And that is, can I say, the more normative meaning as a whole of the nifal stem. And so Paul, quoting the Septuagint, and the Septuagint 
actually uh, interprets that as passive. In you, all nations of the earth will be blessed. And so in Galatians chapter 3, Paul quotes from that very text and applies it to Christ and how that ultimately being taking it as passive from the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible around 200 BC, uh, the text reads, Know therefore that they who are of faith, these are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles, would justify the Gentiles out of faith, declared the gospel in advance to Abraham that in you, in you lagethesantai is the Greek, shall be blessed all nations, so that they who are of faith, out of faith, are being blessed with faithful Abraham. So this was a key covenant, the Abrahamic covenant or the Abrahamic promise that promises blessing. And New Testament teaching is that it's actually happening in Jesus Christ, that he's the centerpiece, taking it as a passive, whereby this is going to happen. Along that very line, um, from what I understand, this was um, not a treaty or a covenant of equals, but it's, it's <coughs> a greater telling a lesser how things are going to be. Exactly. And you especially see that in Genesis 15, <coughs> where God is telling Abraham to <laughs> divide the animals. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> he divides all of the animals except the birds. And God alone passes through the pieces. Mm -hmm. Abraham is given a tardema, which in Hebrew means of deep sleep, and a smoking uh, furnace passes through the pieces. It's a blood covenant, but it's unconditional in that God alone is making the covenant, as you're mm -hmm. saying. Abraham's asleep. By the way, it's sort of interesting, the same Hebrew word is used of uh, in Genesis that God in two, Genesis two, God gave Abraham or, or Adam a tardema, a hmm. deep sleep. It's only used twice there and here in this section of Better Sheet or Genesis. So what is interesting as we, as we come uh, to chapter 15, God alone is making the covenant and many have called it an unconditional covenant. It's based upon him mm -hmm. alone. Abraham, it was thought that both would walk through the pieces together, but instead, only God passes through the pieces, mm -hmm. making that unconditional covenant. I'll never forget a humorous incident when I was studying uh, at Dropsy in the Jewish world. I had to read that text in Hebrew to one of my teachers, a rabbi, and he said, Reverend Stats, he said, uh, why didn't he cut the birds in half? And I was stumbling. I had no idea. And I thought I was trying to think of ancient Near Eastern reasons for it and everything. He said, Reverend Stats, you got to use your common sense when you do exegesis. If you cut the bird, all you have is feathers flying around. <laughs> I'll never forget that because I was so nervous, you know, having to read it and recite <laughs> that I was trying to find some solution. But at any rate, that covenant is unconditional. And I think that addresses your question that God alone is making the covenant. And that's, I think, an evidence of God's graciousness as well. Um, we're really not able to uphold our end much that's of right. the time. And exactly. we look, the New Testament looks back to Abraham as an example of <coughs> faith, and he is that, but he certainly <coughs> didn't have a perfect faith. Right. And he certain, certainly was not a perfect person again. So um, can you say some more about Abraham and his, uh, his story as it unfolds? Yeah, uh, it's interesting. As we look at Abraham and he begins to follow the Lord, building altars to the Lord wherever he goes, the Lord has promised him that he would bring blessing in him. But Abraham when Sarah 
I think you're thinking of the text in 13 when he approaches Egypt. He says, say you're my sister <laughs> because they might do away with me and take you because you're beautiful. And so say you're my sister. Now that was a half lie uh, <laughs> because uh, she was, could have had the title of wife's sister according to the Hurrian culture. But it still wasn't fully telling the truth. And so when we look at a text like that, no, Abraham was not perfect. And his faith really, uh, can I say, had something to be desired at that point, right? Yes. In other, <laughs> in other words, he uh, basically was willing to sacrifice Sarah at that point. Uh, and yet, in spite of that, the Lord is going to use Abraham and through him bless uh, all of us because of Christ coming through his lineage and seed and everything as believers in Jesus. You mentioned there were a couple different covenants with Abraham. Could <laughs> yes. you outline those? Well, when you look at the book of Genesis, the covenant theme of Genesis permeates Genesis, sort of like a pearl through the Genesis. For example, here in chapter 12, to start with 12, he's promised to be a great nation, promised to be blessed by those that bless him, and told to be a blessing, and also promised that there would be a curse on those that curse him and his seed, but in him all nations would be blessed. So those are some of the elements of that promise. Then you come to chapter 13, and the Lord says, look, Abraham, if you can count the dust of the earth, that's the way your seed's going to be. It's going to be multitudinous. It's going to be great and, and numerous. Then in chapter 15, we have the blood covenant, which takes the promise and makes it now, can I say, unconditional by the Lord passing through the pieces. And so that's like the confirmation of the promise via the covenant. Then in chapter 17 of Genesis, he tells Abraham to look at the stars. If you can number the stars, that's how numerous your seed's going to be. And he also tells him that kings will come from him, <coughs> which is interesting because when we look at uh, 2 Samuel chapter 7, uh, from David will come one who will reign on David's throne forever, ad olam, forever. And it is my understanding that that promise in 17 has its ultimate direction to the Davidic covenant and a king who's going to reign on David's throne forever. Uh, so that is another reiteration. By the way, in the New Testament in Luke, Chapter 1, Gabriel announces to Mary that Christ will reign over the house of Jacob forever, <laughs> fulfilling, I believe, that covenant. Then you come <laughs> to chapter 22, and it's reiterated again after the Isaac incident, <laughs> Abraham Isaac incident. And then again, it's related to Isaac in chapter 26, one short chapter, but the covenant is repeated through Isaac. Then Jacob, when he's on his way to Uncle Laban's in chapter 28, has the covenant reiterated when God appears to him in the ladder from heaven. And then at the end of that time with Laban, the covenant is reiterated again as the Lord appears to him in 32 and then in 35. And then finally, as Jacob goes down into Egypt, it's reiterated another time in 46 as he's going into Egypt. And then, of course, on in the book of Exodus 3 and so forth. So the covenant theme is a basic theme that knits together, mm -hmm. can we say, the book yeah. of Genesis from beginning to end. <coughs> One interesting question would have to do with the, the connection between Abraham's faith and this covenant, and the, the peculiar mark of circumcision. Why would God <laughs> use such a sign where there is a, there's a, a cutting of the flesh mm -hmm. on our bodies to, to reflect 
our relationship with him. Interesting. Circumcision was known in some areas of the ancient Near East, but I think God used it in a special way in Genesis 17 to give the Israelite, especially the male Israelite, an ongoing realization every time he would view himself of a covenantal relationship with the Lord that would be a physical constant reminder of what the Lord is expecting, what he's done. And uh, so I think it was critically important to the Lord to have that visible reminder, it seems to me, in the midst of possibly a culture where many were not circumcised, mm -hmm. of a covenantal relationship that the individual was responsible to the Lord to carry out in obedience to him. One particular point that Abraham struggled with in his relationship with the Lord <coughs> was that he was not able to bear a son, mm. an heir. Mm. And at one point he said, what can you give me since I don't have a son? Right. Um, how did the Lord use that longing for descendants and the promise of descendants to guide Abraham's faith? <coughs> well... I think all the way through the Abrahamic narrative, we see his faith developing. Mm -hmm. And uh, in chapter 15, as you've said, he so much wanted uh, a descendant to take place in uh, uh, his servant. But no, and then it wasn't really through Hagar and Ishmael. Mm -hmm. And all the way through, he's building him uh, the hope and the anticipation building in his thought and mind that this would be through Sarah and through his own uh, wife in that way, uh, his wife Sarah. It's also interesting that many speak, and especially the rabbis will talk about how his faith develops. Mm -hmm. And there is a phrase in Hebrew, lech lecha, you go, Abraham. Literally, lake is an imperative. Go, lecha, for yourself. Lake, lecha, go. It appears only one other time in the Abrahamic narrative, and that's in Genesis 22, mm. when he's called to offer up Isaac. Lake, lecha. God never intended for Abraham to literally sacrifice Isaac. He's only testing him. But Abraham, we're told by the writer of Hebrews, had faith even in the resurrection of Isaac, that his faith had grown from let's say say you're my sister in right. the wife <laughs> sistership idea to now faith in the development of abraham's own inner uh, can i say trust in the lord and the rabbis point that out by that repetition of lake lecha only twice there in the hebrew here in 12 and then in 22 showing the development of his mm -hmm. faith so yeah I think the Lord was allowing his faith to develop, and we see that all the way through Genesis. We'll see it in Joseph, we'll see it, and we see it in our own lives, that uh, circumstances happen, and it's a time for faith growth, and the Lord wants our faith to, to grow and trust in him, even when it seems impossible for things to maybe work out in the way that we would anticipate. <laughs> that was a long process. Abram mm. was 75 or so when he was called, and Isaac was born when he was around 100 or mm. so. So yes. that's a long, a long <coughs> period of waiting. Yes. And, um, and yet the Lord kept his promise, and I think that's an yes. important part of of the development of our faith as we realize that, that the Lord is in fact faithful. Faithful, to keep, our, to keep his word, exactly. How is that maybe reflected in the name chosen for? Yitzchak, Isaac. Uh, Yitzchak means laughter. And uh, you have it used in 18 uh, where Sarah laughs, uh, you know, uh, when Abraham's told he's going to have a son through Sarah and how old they are. The Lord's <laughs> going to do a miracle. And uh, so when the son is born, 
the miracle of laughter, Yitzchak, is that God does keep his promise. Mm. And there is laughter, there's excitement in that. And so I think the name uh, was used in irony in 18 about the wrong kind of laughter mm -hmm. that Sarah had. But yet, when Isaac was born, there is a good laughter. And Yitzchak is really what that means. It has the idea in Hebrew, uh, laughter. Or, and, and so we can have a good laughter and we can have a mocking laughter. And I think uh, the Lord wants to bring us to that good <laughs> laughter that we see. <coughs> yeah, so the promise is fulfilled in Isaac. Yes. And then the Lord tests Abraham. Yes. And uh, I'm sure a lot of folks wonder how God could even ask such a thing of Abraham <coughs> to mm. test him in that way. But, um, but the Lord uses that incident to lay the foundation of what our faith in him and his provision for us <coughs> is all about. So could you maybe walk through that Mount Moriah incident? Yes. In Genesis 22... Uh, we have the second Lech Lecha, when God tells Abraham to offer up his son as a sacrifice. But we're already told in the text that God was only testing Abraham. God never intended for Abraham to literally sacrifice his son. I believe what we have here in that text is a statement, number one, against child sacrifice. Which was, or, uh, which was, or human sacrifice, which was done in Canaanite religion. <clears throat> I believe the Torah, the book of Genesis, is making a strong statement against human sacrifice in 22. But now, what is interesting, this whole text, I think, becomes a type of John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I remember when I was studying uh, in the Jewish world that one of my rabbi teachers said, if I was a Christian, I would preach a lot on Genesis 22. And he was thinking of mm -hmm. uh, John, uh, I'm sure, John 3, 16. Mm -hmm. I think we have an illustration given by the Lord of later revelation <clears throat> in that Abraham is like God the Father and Isaac becomes a type of Christ. Isaac even carries the wood and Christ carries his own mm -hmm. cross. Then the type is the, the ram. In other words, uh, while Isaac carries the wood and Christ carries the cross, Isaac is rescued. God never intended for Isaac to become a sacrifice, but he provided a ram that was caught in the thicket. And that becomes a, Christ, a type of Christ, I believe. In John chapter one, behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And so this is a, a can I say, a depiction of the gospel, especially for a Christian. Uh, you know, I, I think in the Jewish world, they would interpret it to mean that Israel goes through a lot of things, even to the point of extinction, which is true, but God is overseeing that. Mm -hmm. As a Christian, I take it into the New Testament that it ultimately has a typological fulfillment mm -hmm. in the Father offering the Son and the obedience of the Son, but then the type, can I say, breaks down with Isaac, and we become like Isaac in that we have a substitute. <laughs> And the substitute is the ram that is, I believe, a reference to Christ, especially in John's gospel, the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And so uh, I think the Lord is using that for more than just teaching uh, Israel's uh, not being, let's say, uh, continuing, but I think it's ultimately as a Christian has Christological meaning. Yeah, so it's, it's encouraging to see a very clear picture of grace mm. in the early chapters of Genesis, and now to see that repeated again 
in the story of Abraham. Exactly. And how, as the ram took Isaac's place, the Lord took our place yeah. as the Lamb of God. And also a strong statement against human sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And the human sacrifice of Christ is God's doing. In other words, God sent his only begotten son uh, in his sovereign government to provide a redemption for us. And we at that point are like Isaac. We need a ram and we need a lamb. And Christ becomes that in his sacrifice. Yes. Now as, as Isaac's story unfolds, <coughs> there's, there's not a whole lot spoken about him other than um, his relationship with his father and then his relationship with his kids. And, uh, and the, the story of his kids is another one of those uh, head scratchers. Yes. <coughs> um, could you talk a little bit about um, Jacob and Esau? Okay. And uh, what <coughs> interesting dynamic is going on with them fighting in the womb? Yes. Interesting that before that, in 25, where you have that Genesis 25, that struggle, uh, we already have the anticipation that Jacob is going to be especially blessed uh, even before birth at that point, mm -hmm. uh, which to me makes a great statement about the sanctity of life from the womb, that God had a destiny for Jacob even before he was born, which I think is a beautiful mm -hmm. statement of how God looks at the sanctity of life in, in the womb. But going on, uh, Isaac only has a short chapter. I think the reason being, he's like a hinge. The covenant is repeated, but his story unfolds, as you've said, in Jacob and Esau's. Now, while God has a plan to bless Jacob in a unique way, and also Esau, but Jacob in a special way in the covenant, uh, Jacob had his problems, as we'll see. Uh, by being deceptive and being a deceiver. But I think we see the sovereign hand of God. As is often said in the rabbinic world, God is sovereign in everything except the fear of God. And so God is sovereign in the way that he has, even before birth, planned what Jacob would be doing in receiving the covenant blessing and uh, so forth. <clears throat> Jacob, of course, being the younger son, um, yes. Esau would have received the, the blessing and the birthright. And yet Jacob, as we know, as you said, the, the deceiver um, swindles his brother right. out of those things. And um, of and, course... And, the, and can we say God's ways are not always according to what we would expect as the standard, right? <laughs> In other words, the Lord has surprises. And I think here, it's not the elder. And all the way through Genesis, we're going to see that kind of a pattern and so forth, even in Joseph's children. So that pattern uh, is throughout Genesis. And I think, again, it shows the sovereign hand of God in working out salvation history that uh, will not always fit what we would expect. Well, one way to ask the question would be why would God allow such a deceitful, swindling person to receive mm. the blessing? But I think the better way to, to ask it is, or to, to state it is that Jacob didn't need to do what he did. <laughs> right. And even though he used sinful means and lived not so nobly, the Lord in his sovereignty still did with Jacob mm -hmm. what he intended to do with him. Exactly. And I think, Rob, what we see here, again, is the grace of God. Uh, Jacob was not the paragon of virtue. <laughs> I mean, he, he was deceptive, uh, and he continued to be, even with Esau at the end. Uh, in chapter 35. So how does the Lord use that? Well, one of the things I believe 
is when you look at the history of Scripture, God often uses people who are flawed, but ultimately have a heart for the Lord. I think Jacob had a heart in the sense that he viewed, he viewed the uh, blessing to be important. Mm -hmm. Where Esau, it didn't mean much to Esau. Uh, he was more of a spiritual man, I think, in that sense. Uh, Esau was more concerned about the bowl of soup that he would get. <laughs> and so I think there's that. And then I think as I look at scripture, Rob, uh, throughout the Hebrew scriptures on into the new, we see the Lord working with sinful people who have an inner heart for the Lord. You take Judah, uh, Jacob, then his son Judah commits incest with Tamar. And yet through the line of Tamar, Messiah comes in Matthew chapter one. Or take Moses who committed violence, and yet the Lord used Moses as, I believe, the great lawgiver. Or Aaron uh, sacrifices to the golden calf. You know, it just came out, uh, he says. <laughs> I'm reminded of a little boy on a, on a bus that I heard about that told his mother that he actually uh, spit on a, another person and said, it just came out of my mouth. You know, I don't know. <laughs> It's sort of like that, you know, but God still <laughs> used Aaron to be the high priest. Mm -hmm. And then David, think of David in 2 Samuel 11 and 12. I wrote my PhD dissertation on David. He blew it in every way. I mean, he committed, he broke all of the Ten Commandments, basically. Adultery, or violence, you name it. And yet God used David after his forgiveness, and Yadidya, uh, beloved of the Lord, is Solomon's name. And so he continues to use David even to write Hebrew poetry after uh, a very dysfunctional life. And then I think of <laughs> Peter, who denies the Lord, and yet he's able to preach the gospel at Pentecost about the outpouring of the Spirit. You, you would think that a church council might have gotten together and said, wait a minute, Peter can't preach yet. He's got to wait for a couple years before he's able to do this. The Lord, and Paul says he's the chiefest of sinners because he was doing violence to fellow Christians, and yet God used Paul. And so when I look at the Hebrew scriptures, starting way back with Jacob, there is a principle that I see that the Lord uses flawed people who have a heart for him, and, and that's just his grace. I remember in a humorous incident teaching this some years back on the West Coast, and I was using these examples, and one of the students was heard to say afterwards, I don't care what Dr. Stat says, these guys would never be on my board. <laughs> <laughs> so it's interesting. We see the grace of the Lord, don't we? And thank this. God we do. Yeah, yeah, because we're all messed up. Yeah. Right? Yes. And it's interesting as Jacob is leaving, he's, he's never going to see his mom again. Yes. Uh, his brother wants to kill him. <coughs> and on the way out and on the way back, the Lord meets him. The Lord reveals yes. to him. He has that vision. And um, once again, we see God's sovereign mm. hand and mm. work. Yes. In Genesis 28, where we have the vision of the ladder, and the Lord yes. brings the covenant now to Jacob, continues what he had given to Isaac and to uh, Abraham, continues the covenant. And uh, so basically we see the grace of the Lord over and over again, don't we? Even though he had done all this and he was on his way to Uncle Laban's, the Lord still reveals his plan that he was going to use Jacob in spite of it all. Good point. And he spends all this time away, um, finds his wives there, uh, has all of these <coughs> sons that yes. become the, the t 12 sons of... Right. Uh, and, uh, and then returns home to, and, uh, and is reconciled with his, with his brother. Mm. Um, 
What sort of work does the Lord do in Jacob in that return? Well, I think, first of all, let me just go back a minute, Rob, to the latter. I think that's a significant moment, sort of as he's beginning his journey. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the Lord's going to appear again with a wrestling match yes. <laughs> as he comes back. Uh, in between, he, what he does, he experiences. He was deceptive. So Laban, Uncle Laban, is deceptive with him, right? Mm. And uh, <laughs> I'm going to give you, uh, you, you know, you, you, your wife, and behold, it was Leah. I get sort of amused at that because he basically experiences what we sow, we reap. Mm -hmm. And I think he experienced that. But at the same time, the Lord was working. And remember, God had said in Genesis 12, I'm going to make you a great nation. I'm going to bless you. And we see that in this narrative. All the children are born, the tribes mm -hmm. resulting. But then after that experience, and can we say teaching <laughs> of Jacob, he then brings him back to the land again and reappears to him again in that wrestling match. And Jacob has grown to the point that he says, you know, I'm not going to let you go unless you bless me. Uh, and of course, a blessing occurs from the Lord. Uh, a couple things Christologically, we as Christian, as we interpret the word, believe that maybe that was a reference to a theophany, an appearance of God in Christ, a Christophany, uh, wrestling at that point prior to the incarnation. And also the latter prior to that, announcing God's, can I say, uh, covenant with Jacob, Jesus applies that to himself. You're going to see the Son of Man and angels going up and down on the Son of Man in John 2. So I think both of those texts have significance not only to Jacob's faith, but also Christological significance mm -hmm. as seen via the New Testament and how the Lord uh, is going to, to have the angels coming up and down ministering to him in the Gospel of John, and how that he wants the blessing. He's not going to let this go mm -hmm. until he gets a blessing. Of course, then he's injured. But I think that basically that shares with us the attitude of an Apostle Paul who, who is seeing the Lord on the uh, road, and the Lord speaks to him and makes him an apostle. And at the very end of his life, he talks about how he wants to know the Lord and how he's fought a good fight and he's finished the course. And so I see Jacob's faith growing and the Lord reappearing, can I say, to reaffirm himself in his life and Jacob willingly wanting that. Now Jacob's sons are born from different mothers mm. there's a bit of favoritism going on i think he picked that up from his parents yes <coughs> uh, but he does favor one particular well two but mm. one especially that comes into the story uh joseph yes and um as we look begin to look at the life of joseph <coughs> we see uh, the lord again at work in a very sovereign yes way mm. um, Joseph's not well liked by his <coughs> brothers as a result of that favoritism. Right. And yet, again, the Lord singles Joseph out mm. by means of these dreams. Um, how are we to orient ourselves to what's going on in Joseph's life? Well, I think the Lord, again, we're seeing his sovereignty uh, <laughs> in the dream that Joseph has and in spite of his father's uh, favoritism, and that probably sparked jealousy on the part of the brothers, as you've said. But we see the Lord's sovereignty in that with Joseph, <clears throat> his goal is to get Israel into Egypt. And we've seen that, we saw that in chapter 15, right? You're going to be in Egypt for 400 years before I bring you back to Canaan. And I believe the, the, the narrative is telling us how that happens. He's going to use Joseph. In spite of all the, 
can I say, negative effects of his, uh, at times, his bragging mm. and, and the father's favoritism. But in that dream, it works out. They would ultimately come and recognize him, right? Yeah. And why did the Lord bring Israel into Egypt and use Joseph? I think that's another issue that, that, that can be addressed. Uh, I think the idea is that Egypt was a very separatistic culture, <clears throat> where Canaan was an, a culture that would assimilate. Mm -hmm. And we would lose, I think the text is saying, had Israel stayed in, in Canaan. We see a gradual decline. I mean, when they first actually went to the land, they're building altars to Yahweh. But then as we watch it in a retrogression, uh, Judah, we have a Canaanite involved. And uh, he goes into a prostitute, a, a holy woman. And the downfall that was occurring. And so Egypt becomes, as one of my professors said, like the womb where the Lord is going to protect that little fetus mm. to grow and become a great nation as we come to Exodus. So I think Joseph is the link mm -hmm. that the Lord is using to affect that reality <clears throat> as, I, as I read and think about the Joseph text. <clears throat> the, um, the very human elements that are going on mm. in Joseph's life, um, being sold by your brothers into slavery, um, being wrongly accused of an attempted rape in Potiphar's household, mm. ending up in jail, Mm. and then being forgotten in jail. Yes. Uh, those texts definitely go to the question, God, what are you doing? Have you forgotten about me? Do you not care about yes, me? Yes, yes. Uh, why are you allowing bad things to happen to me? And yet even during those times, we see the Lord um, noticing Joseph, being with Joseph so yes. that he succeeds. Yes. So those two <laughs> dynamics continue to be going on. And... Um, how is the Lord at work preparing Joseph? I think he's, he's working in Joseph and also working in his brothers uh, to prepare them to come to Egypt and, and also his father, Jacob. But he's building Joseph into a greater person through what he went through and ultimately wanting to elevate him to be what second... Uh, <laughs> second in uh, Egypt uh, sort of reminds me of a humorous incident. One of uh, our, my students here said he took a church pastorate and one of his ch children was talking <laughs> about uh, the, the secretary and said, now this is your office, right? And the, the child is probably about eight and uh, the uh, person said, yeah, this is my office. And, well, that's great. You're second in command then, aren't you? My dad's the first year, he was saying. But I, <laughs> I, I think about that. I sort of had to, had to chuckle. But Joseph became second in command yeah. uh, in Egypt. And the Lord was preparing him through all of his trials. And I'm thinking, Rob, that in life, I don't know whether you've experienced this, but I've found that sometimes you feel, where is the Lord? I don't know where I'm going. I don't know whether I'm pleasing you, Lord, or what I'm doing. But somehow I love you, and I know you're at work. And I think we all have those moments. But to read the story of Joseph, to know that no matter what we seem to be going through circumstantially, to know that if we love the Lord, he's working all things to good for those that love him. I'm thinking of Romans 8. And we see that in the Joseph narrative. Not only for Joseph, but for his family, for Israel as a whole, all these things. But at the time, it didn't look like it. I mean, and, and so I think applicationally, we can relate to that. Yeah. As circumstances unfolded in Joseph's life, he began to see that the Lord had a 
a greater plan behind all of these things when he realized that not only was there a famine and he was going to be in position to help, but that his own family um, and the, the people of promise were in jeopardy as a result of this famine. And God had placed him yeah, exactly. in a position to, to help. It helped him to see, but then even as his brothers come to him, he was fighting his own issues of, mm. of forgiveness. Um, what does the Lord teach us in this Joseph story about the, that, that grace that we can offer others in the role of forgiveness? Well, I think Joseph becomes a perfect model, Rob, of the attitude of forgiveness. That no matter what his brothers had done to him, he wept when he mm. saw his younger brother and, and the Lord touched his heart and he had a forgiving heart. And even at the end of the narrative, at the end of Joseph's life, he said, you meant it for evil, but the Lord meant it for good. Mm. And I think forgiveness is based upon that reality that others may mean something in a negative way, but the Lord is at work if we're wanting to please him and love him. And uh, so forgiveness is a key element in that text, and especially as we look at Joseph and his attitude toward his brothers and what they basically had done to him, and yet his willingness to say, that's okay, I forgive you. You meant it for a wrong cause, but the Lord was looking at something else. So as we look over the whole um, era of the patriarchs, we can again see the Lord is laying a foundation for yes. the rest of the scriptures. Mm. And we can certainly see um, the, the Messiah coming a long ways away. Yeah. Could you Absolutely. maybe give a recap of Genesis in that light? Absolutely. Uh, I think we started out in Genesis 1, uh, the creation of man, anticipating the final perfect man. Adam blew it. Jesus takes us out of that situation as the second Adam, Romans chapter 5. I think also we see the fall and we see, as we said, the victory of Christ, the, the seed of the woman mm -hmm. over the serpent. We also see in the great Abrahamic covenant that in, in Abraham all nations would be blessed. In Galatians chapter 3, Paul applies that to the work of Christ who has caused that to happen. I think another place that we could, we could touch on is Melchizedek, Melchizedek mm -hmm. in chapter 14 uh, meets Abraham and offers uh, wine and bread the very elements that Christ has offered in his death for us. And the writer of Hebrews picks up that theme of the greatness of the Melchizedekian priesthood. Even Abraham paid tithes, mm -hmm. and Aaron in Abraham to a greater priesthood. And it's by virtue of his resurrection that he abides a priest forever. And he alludes to Psalm 110, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Great text used mm -hmm. in Hebrews chapter seven. Also, as we think through the book of Genesis, we then have the offering up uh, or the uh, Abraham Isaac text where John 3.16 comes to mind. Mm -hmm. uh, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him. And there again, I think Abraham is a type of the father, Isaac a type of the obedience of Christ, but the ram fulfilling the sacrifice, mm -hmm. a type of our Lord in what he's done, the Lamb of God, mm -hmm. and saving us just like Isaac was rescued by the ram. So we are by the Lamb of God. Then I think we see the latter in 28, and Christ applies that to himself, that he's the, can I say, the way, the truth, and the mm -hmm. life to heaven, to the Father. And he alludes to that again in 14 of John. Uh, following that, we have the narrative of Joseph. Now, Joseph is not ever quoted directly as a type of Christ in the New Testament, but he beautifully fulfills it. He's mm -hmm. sold by his brothers. Christ is rejected by his Jewish brethren, 
of the first uh, century. Then he takes a Gentile bride. Christ has wedded the church that's, that's not totally uh, Gentiles, but uh, predominantly at this point. But then Joseph is reunited with his brothers. Paul says in Romans chapter 11 that there's a day coming when all Israel will then turn to Messiah. There will be a great movement to Christ, I believe, in uh, Romans chapter uh, 11. But then also the lion of the tribe of Judah in chapter 49, uh, where Jacob gives what each son will be doing, comes to Judah and says he's a lion's whelp. And the scepter will not depart from Judah until Shiloh come. And uh, Christian interpreters have understood that to be a reference to Christ, to whom it belongs, mm -hmm. can, can be the Hebrew, the way it's read. Uh, and it's, it's interesting that uh, the scepter, meaning that it will not depart from Judah until Messiah comes. And it's interesting in Revelation 4 and 5, the lion of the tribe of Judah has conquered to open the seals. Mm -hmm. And I can remember uh, years ago when I uh, taught at a, at a school on the West Coast, one of the colleagues that I taught with, I respected very highly, used to have the class sing, Oh, the lion of Judah has conquered to open the sealed book and given us the victory again and again, again and again. So I think ultimately we have all of these Christological elements mm -hmm. and the Abrahamic covenant is the centerpiece running through anticipating kingship in 17 and then in 49 of Genesis. So yes, I think it's full to me of, of pointing to the person and work of Jesus Christ, yes. my Lord and Savior. Well, this has been a, a very insightful walk through the, the book of beginnings, and mm. I can hardly wait to see how the rest of this unfolds. So I Great. look forward to our conversations going on. Thank you, Rob. It's been a joy to be able to talk through this. Thank you so much. Well, good. Well, we so will much. see you next time. God bless you. Look forward to it. Thank you.